Welcome everyone. I'd like to introduce our work, Memphis. In the field of art,
这个是桃眼这个人 Hi, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, like, can I like uh, do the dry run for the video playing? Just make sure that the noisy yeah. background will not influence the quality. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hello everyone, I'd like to introduce our work, Elfis. In the field of architecture designs, a growing number of processors are... Does it work? I think it works. Okay. Yeah. So, will, so for the rest of uh, three speakers, will they present it in online or will you rec play the recorded video as well? Uh... As long as I know that there is just one pre-recorded recorded video and another two speakers will like present by themselves. Another two, but we have four in total, right? Oh, the others, I mean, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So you mean, you mean other three will also yeah. will present in like a wow Zoom? Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. This is a uh, Fan Ruo, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Fan Ruo. Hi everyone, I'm just checking in. Is, is everything okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank uh you. we 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 actually just uh 
uh, with the first speaker. The first, uh, the first uh, uh, talk will be uh, played from the video, but the, the wow. rest of three, they will be presented in, uh, uh, in, uh, in about Zoom, I think. Oh, I see. So the first speaker, did they contact you? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Actually, she's here, right? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Yes, yes. I'm here. Oh, 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 you're here. Oh, it's, it's, oh sorry. Wait, wait. It's, uh, you, you want to present, uh, you don't want to present it uh, like uh, in while Zoom. You just want to play the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I prepared the say the video so i want to play the record uh, the pre-recorded video okay okay that's fine yeah okay yeah. as long as you prefer this way it's fine yeah yes and but you will be you will be ready for the q a session if there are any questions right okay 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 i will, I, I, I will, will be ready okay okay so we will be just waiting for the other three speakers i think uh, we uh we will the other three speakers, Hui Chuan, uh, Ding Xiaofeng, uh, Samuel, we haven't shown up yet, but it's still like uh, seven minutes away, so I think we are fine. Hi, Weiwen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Bye, morning. Yo. Good. How are you? Good, good. And today, today is our, uh, I mean, uh, our, uh, it's, a, it's a, 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 the full break of our university, so... Really? Yeah, I also heard something like a holiday, but uh, I haven't found it in Pitt's calendar. So. I see. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you, you have a break, like a one-day break? Uh, actually, you know, we still need to work. <laughs> That's anyway, true. Uh, yes, I, I just, just arrived. A bonus working day. <laughs> yes, 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 exactly. I just arrived <laughs> at the, the office. Yeah. Okay, Samuel is here. Samuel is here? Good. Hello. Can hello, you hello. Me? Yes, great. Samuel, good morning. Good morning. When you got the file, right? I got the first two speakers file. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I think I have the, the file of AV speaker. Okay. So um, the full break of for kids program is actually the Friday of this week. Kids so Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I think that is different for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Xiaofu is here. Hi, Xiaofu. Oh. We only have uh, we only need to wait for Zheng Zheng Huichuan, the second speaker. Okay.
Okay. Wei Wen, do you have a contact for Hui Chuan? Uh, let me check it. Yeah, thank you. So let's wait, wait for one more minute. And I think we need uh, all four speakers here. Uh, by the way, do, do, uh, Pepe, do you think that we need to wait all the speaker here and uh, start the session or we can, you know, that Hui Chuan is in the second speaker. Okay. So maybe I think, we can uh, start and I can yeah. contact with him. That's good. Yeah. I'm sorry, but who is speaking? Oh, yeah. Okay, this is Wei So let me introduce the first speaker. Yeah, who is? Okay. So shall I like play the video or we have to wait for a few more minutes? Oh, uh, actually, I'm not very sure. Are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I, I just want to say, you just say that maybe you want to introduce the, the first speaker and then we can start, I think. Okay, so I think we can start. Uh... Yeah, for sure. Okay, let's start. Uh, let me first introduce uh, Wei, Wei Wei Chen. Wei Chen received the Bachelor of Science degree from University of Electronic Science and Technology of China, UESDC Chengdu, China in 2016, and the PhD degree in Computer Science from the Institute of Computer Computing Technology, ICT China, Chinese Academy of Science, Beijing, China in 2022. His research interests include computer architecture and hardware acceleration for deep learning. Okay, Maru, I think you can start now. Uh, Angela, I think we cannot hear anything. Uh, Maru, Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce our work, Memphis. In the field of architecture designs, a growing number of processors are pursuing reconfigurability so that they can support flexible resources reallocation to achieve better performance and energy cost trade-off. But due to the tremendous configuration spaces and complex interactions between these configuration parameters, for all these reconfigurable architectures, how to determine the optimal hardware configuration and the appropriate amount of resources required by the target task remains a significant challenge. Currently, to deal with this dynamic resources allocation problem, machine learning has been applied. These ML-based approaches first train a learner to predict the system's behavior 
which acts as a performance predictor. And then deploy this performance predictor as a main part of the whole resources schedule. However, these ML-based approaches still have several limits. First, the high runtime overhead, as they have to tentatively evaluate a group of possible configurations and then decide the best one. Second, they suffer the scale's data problem, for they need lots of training samples to improve the prediction accuracy. Last, the asymmetric benefits phenomenon, which means in the reconfigurable space, only a small group of configurations on the parental front optimal frontier is crucial for reconfigurable system management. But improving the prediction accuracy of non-optimal configurations may not help imply a good system result. So these problems above made us wonder, can we generate the parental optimal configurations directly? Recent development of generative adversary learning shows its ability to capture the relationship between two domains from the data that can transfer one domain space to another domain through semi-supervised joint distribution mapping, such as again, which have been applied to the text to image generation. So we were inspired by it and proposed to build a configuration generator which can transfer the performance domain to the resources configuration domain through the generative adversary learning. However, it's difficult to directly build the configuration generator. Therefore, in our work, we assume the performance predictor and the resources schedule are two models that capture the relationship between the configuration domain and the performance domain. For the performance predictor, it estimates the system performance metric Y for the workload as a function F of the architecture configuration X, given the application characteristics A. And for the resources schedule, it generates a configuration X given the performance requirement Y and application characteristics A. So finally, we have designed the quaternary GAN which builds the performance predictor and the resources schedule in the form of duality and have the schedule's performance to be improved incrementally. Here's the architecture of the quaternary GAN, which holds two generators. The performance predictor GY builds the conditional distribution PY, while the configuration generator GX characterize the conditional distribution Px in the opposite direction. Then we use the discriminator one, which distinguishes real data paths from two types of fake data paths to encourage the two generators to produce more real-like paths. We also use a discriminator two which determines whether a sample is from the performance predictor or the configuration generator. Which, in other words, the output of the discriminator two pushes those two distributions as close as possible for helping the training state to converge. Therefore, the training goes on in a loop. In each loop, on receiving the result of the two discriminators, we update these four models based on the discriminator's feedback. And so, both generators and discriminators get improved in the minimax game. And the game ends until the four players are at a large equilibrium. In the experiment, we use Sniper to simulate an x 8 sync based reconfigurable processor and the tuning knobs of relevant resources are listed in the table two. And we use several MLPs to implement the generators and discriminators. To show the efficiency of our work, we choose five baseline methods for comparison. As to the experiment results, first, we want to measure the schedule's ability to minimize system energy. So we deploy each application with borrowing performance demands 
and assume we know a priori of the mean performance and max performance for any improved and application. If they are allocated with all of the processors available resources, then we test each approach to generate the configuration that meets the constraints for the workload. As we can see, efforts incurs only 3.02 percentage more energy cost than the optimal. Second, we perform a sensitivity a sensitivity analysis to show the approaches behave as a function of their sampling budget. We assume a scale training data scenario that will limit the number of configurations to form the labeled training set. Seen from the right figure, efforts can still achieve good results with less labeled data in the training set, where all others do poorly for small configuration numbers. So we can say the emphasis is more robust in the scale state type situation. Here we show an insight on why on why emphasis is effective in the reconfigurable processor resource allocation problem. And we choose two applications, FFT and X264 as examples. We have visualized the relative changes of the hardware low level metrics of the using the schedule biasing. In the figure, the before presents the system behavior of without schedule biasing in the training process. The aft presents the system behavior with schedule biasing. So we can see biasing the schedule to determine the parental optimal configurations makes efforts offer higher system efficiency. And this improved is not only because the efforts use a generative approach to build the schedule that directly constrains the mapping relationship between the configurations and performance, but also does it make the schedules focus on parental optimal configurations through schedule biasing. To sum up, in this work, we present a low overhead resources manager for reconfigurable architectures, EMFAS, which employs the quaternary gains novels designed to simultaneously train the processor performance predictor and the configuration generator through semi-supervised adversary learning. And we emphasize that determining a parental optimal configuration is the most important in resource allocation problems. Hopefully, this work can inspire future work to find more simple ways to determine the parental optimal configurations. More details can be found in our paper. Thanks for your attention. Okay, great. So I think uh, we can, uh, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask now or put your questions in the chat box. And uh, I think uh, we have uh, enough uh, Q&A session after all the talk. But if uh, there are no questions, I think we can move to the second speaker. Hui Chuan, can you start share your screen? Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, while Hui Chuan is preparing, let me introduce Hui Chuan. Hui Chuan Zhen received a Bachelor of Engineering degree in School of Computer Science and Technology from Shandong University, China in July 2020. He's currently pursuing a PhD degree with the School of Computer Science and Technology, Shandong University. His research interests include non volatile FPGA and FPGA logic synthesis. Let's welcome Hui Chuan. Hui Chuan, I think you can start now. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Zhong Hui Chuan from Shandong University. I'm glad to have this opportunity to give this talk. Uh, my presentation today is about adaptive mode transformation for well leveling in non volatile FPGAs. Uh, first, we will talk about some background of FPGA and non volatile memories. Traditional FPGA architectures take SRAM as their on chip memory, however, which uh, with the development of applications like big data processing and edge computing. The requirement on uh, the capacity of DRAM is continuously increasing. Uh, as we can see from this table, 
uh, SRAM based um, ERAM has a limited density. In addition, high leakage power and uh, volatility are also drawbacks that cannot be ignored. Uh, to address this problem, uh, researchers chose to utilize non volatile memories to replace the SRAM in FTJ, uh, which brings FTJ advantages in uh, capacity, power consumption, performance, and robustness. In addition, the MLC mode can further improve the cell density where multiple bits can be stored in a single cell. And researchers have proposed the NVFTJ architecture based on various non volatile memories to satisfy the requirements of data intensive and low power applications. Uh, non volatile memory can be used in most of the FTJ components. Uh, such as configurable logical blocks, um, connection boxes, and switch boxes, uh, and the most important, uh, the block RAMs. Uh, however, uh, non volatile memories face the challenge of a uh, limited, uh, limited lifetime. The situation is even worse when it works in MLC mode, since block RAMs are the most uh, frequently accessed subject. Uh, among all components, it has the most severe endurance issue. The effective lifetime of non volatile FPGA is highly constrained by block RAMs. Thus, the leveling scheme should be employed for block RAMs in, uh, to improve their lifetime. Okay. Then we, uh, I will talk about the motivation and the main idea of this work. Existing real leveling strategies are mostly based on reconfigurations like this, uh, which will bring a heavy performance overhead and may extend the critical path. In addition, the distribution of write operation inside each VRAM is also uneven. So there is an underlying potential to balance well within each VRAM. Take PCM as an example. It, it can endure a maximum of seven to eight power of 10 writes in SLC mode. Well, in MLC mode, um, the cell will wear out up to 10 to the fifth power of write. The lifetime gap between these two modes uh, is huge. So we propose to utilize SLC mode to protect those write intensive sub-blocks. In each block RAM, several sub-blocks are reserved as SLC partner sub-blocks. For write intensive MLC block, block it can move half of its data into a SLC sub-block, uh, partner sub-block, and then transform itself into SLC mode for endurance advantage. Uh, the proposed wear leveling scheme is based on this mode transformation operation. Compared with the mode transformation-based wear leveling strategy for CPU-based architectures, there are two main challenges. Firstly, due to the limited resources in NVFTJ, we, the, the wear leveling scheme should be performed in a more efficient manner. Secondly, since the swap range is restricted within each VRAM, uh, we need a more effective SLC management policy. Uh, now I will show some detail about the proposed wear leveling scheme. First, the right behavior monitor, which monitors all sub blocks during the program execution and collect information about the write operations. Um, for each sub block, we set a counter to record the write behavior. Uh, a counter is separated into two parts with, uh, based on the threshold. The endurance counter is used to record the grade of wear of each sub block, which will continuously grow as time goes by, uh, while the frequency counter will be reset once one of them reaches the predefined threshold. Since, um, since those frequency counters will be synchronously reset, the count in those frequency counters can be directly took as the right frequency recently. Uh, however, the carry propagation from the frequency counter to the endurance counter will be blocked. Um, to address this problem, uh, several redundant bits are introduced into endurance counter to deliver a message between these two kind of counters. Uh, in addition, although SLC sub blocks have much longer endurance, they also bear more intensive writes. So the wear of S um, SLC sub blocks should also be considered. Mm, since the pair of SLC sub blocks will always be updated together, we use the counter of the 
partner SLC blocks for final grain counter. Also, the endurance count, their endurance counter will both be updated according to the carry out from uh, carry out from the SLC sub-block frequency counter. With the endurance and frequency information collected by the right behavior monitor, we introduce a metric called cost to evaluate the necessity of a sub-block to work in SLC mode. This is the definition of cost. The frequency count is the count of frequency counter, which can be regarded as an estimation of near future rights due to the locality. And the wear rate can be further expressed like this, which the plan, which presents the grade of aging of the sublock. Uh, the cost takes both near future workload and history wear into consideration. A sublock will, which, which will face intensive rights or have been heavily worn is more likely to be protected with SLC mode. However, the cost function includes two steps of division, which is extensive for non-volatile FPGAs. Uh, to address this problem, uh, an approximation method is designed. Uh, the first step is on this equation. Uh, since the initial endurance of each sub-block is the same, we can just ignore the effect of the denominator. Uh, then the subtraction in numerator can be expressed by a series of Invert operations. Uh, if we only keep the leftmost one in the result, the denominator of uh, cost can be expressed like this. Then the calculation of the cost can be approximated like this. And as a result, the value of cost can be directly get by left shift the count of frequency counter by MB. Uh, at last, a uh, mode transformation manager will improve lifetime based on the evaluation result. During the program execution, mode transformation manager will select an um, MLC subblock as MLC candidate once it reaches a predefined threshold. In addition, we also set a sub threshold to recognize those subblocks uh, whose frequency comes to close to the original threshold. These subblocks will also be selected as candidates. Then the mode transformation manager will evaluate these MLC candidates along with current SLC sub-block sub uh, based on their cost to determine which of them will work in SLC mode in the next series. Based on the result of evaluation, mode transformation manager performs mode transformation. This is a simple example of the proposed rural leveling scheme. Uh, and uh, this figure shows how a mode transformation actually be performed between two sub-blocks. In the last section, we will show some experimental results. First, we compare the post-cost-based wear leveling scheme with several mode transformation-based schemes with different SL, uh, SLC management policy, uh, such as FIFO IFU. Um, and also a reconfiguration based scheme. Uh, as a result, uh, the post scheme can achieve better lifetime enhancement. We also evaluated uh, the different size of reserved SLC space. Uh, the results show the trend of increasing lifetime improvement uh, with bigger size of reserved SLC space. As for the size of um, the sub block. Um, the results show that the finer the granularity is, the higher improvement can be achieved. Um, that's all my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Uh, if you still have any questions, um, this is my email address. Uh, please feel free to contact us. Thank you, Huichuan. Okay, so uh, so Huichu, do do um take can you take some some online questions? So because I think we have a lot of audience okay. here. Okay. Um, so okay. yeah, so so maybe uh any audience has some questions, maybe you can just uh, unmute and uh, ask questions. 
Oh, if not, actually, I have one question. So, so do, uh, during the presentation, if I understand correctly, actually, you 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 based on the uh, uh some counters to to uh to uh record the uh I mean the right or something uh like the use of each block. So my question is that whether the counter itself can be become the bottleneck and uh, uh, experienced the uh the uh the where uh, where uh, the, the the such kind of duration problem. Mm, yeah, it's a could be a problem. Yeah, and we use the uh, counters uh, in in the DRAM. Okay, so so the, the, the counter is in DRAM, so that is not in the block RAM, right? Uh, DRAM, which is uh, okay. block RAM. I see, I see. So so um, the, so the question. Oh, okay, I see, I see, I see. So it is not uh, not not used in a long volatile memory. So it does not have the duration issue at all. Yeah, it's not a non volatile memory. We use uh, registers to uh, build this compass. I see. I see. So so in this figure, actually, on uh, the the uh, the left hand hand part, uh, uh, actually, it is in the, uh, the long long volatile memory like the MLC and ASLC, but the counter actually they are not on uh, on the same memory. Section. Okay. Uh, okay. Great. Oh, uh, I, I think I, can, I think you addressed my question. So, so do we have any further questions on this talk? Yeah. So, if no, we do not have questions, uh, let's thank our speaker, and then we can move to the next speak. Uh, next speaker. All right. So, you. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Huizhen, and. Uh, and uh, I, I think our third speaker will, uh, will be Xiaofeng. Uh, and Xiaofeng, um, do you want to share screen at this moment? Okay. Um, sure. Sure, when, when, you, when you do the configuration, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our third speaker. Xiaofeng is a master student from Chongqing University. He received his bachelor degree from the Computer Science and the Technology at the China University of, of Mining and the Technology in 2020. Uh, he, his current research interests include the domain-specific accelerator design and the intelligent computing. So Xiaofeng, uh, just to start your presentation. Okay. Hello, everyone. I, um, I'm very glad to present our research work FIL fast and reconfigurable accelerator for distributed sound consolidation. My presentation is mainly divided into four parts. I will first introduce the basis of sound consolidation and our motivations for research. Then I will detail the method proposed in your research. Next, I will explain our experiment and the related results. Finally, I will talk about the conclusion. Sound source localization has been widely applied in industrial and civil fields. For instance, it can be used for fault detection of a mechanical system and can be under its operation in air environments with UAVs. In addition, this technology can also play a role in audio and video conferences and intelligent AI scenarios. But the traditional sound source localization system is based on a single algorithm. For example, SSL based on the TDA method. It, it leverages the time delay differences of the sound from signal or arriving at uh, different microphones to determine the direct of the pocket sound source. And uh, mm, this method has low computational complexity and high real-time performance, but it's easily affected by factors such as reverberation and reflection without in, in a correct localization. And, uh, Another method is SRP-based SSL. It enables the microphone to respond to the beam in particular directions. It, di it differentiates the desired signal from the noise and the interference based on its location in the spectrum. This typical beamform mechanism is the delay and sound beamformer, and it works by compensating the signal delay to each microphone appropriately before they are combined using the adaptive operation. The outcome of the delay signal summation is the enhancement of the desired signal. It enhances the signal from the direction of the target sound source and suppresses the signal from other directions. And uh, compared to the TDOA, the SRP-based approach shows stronger robustness to reverberation and reflection. Nonetheless, it requires the omnidirectional research 
omnidirectional search for the single energy with a certain range, which determines the localization precision and a large amount of computation is needed for each point in the range. Consequently, the SRP-based approach includes high computational complexity and, and leads to low real-time performance. Therefore, the current SSL system has the following challenges. The SSL system based on a single algorithm cannot meet the application requirements in a variety of sound source environments, such as real-time robustness for reverberation and reflection. And the software-based SSL system causes excessive response delay. So our research wants to design a localization method that can adapt to various sound source environments and the high real-time SSL system that can quickly respond to sound source. So we design a novel localization algorithm, FPL, to adapt to virus localization environments. FPL is a two-stage algorithm, and it uses multiple distributed nodes for localization. The first stage of FPL is that each distributed node uses a TDOA method to obtain the position direction of the target sound source related to the, each node. And through this direction information, to obtain the appropriate position of the target sound source. The direction information sourcing process is shown in the figure. The green cycles represent the location of the distributed nodes, microphone errors, and the red cycles represent the estimated location of the target sound source. Based on the direction information, each node, each node can generate two rays with a specific angle around direction and the rays from different nodes will intersect and form an intersect arrow. The gray tip center of the intersection arrow is the appropriate location of the target sound source. This is the first stage of the FPL. Then, based on the position coordinates of the first stage, that is the red point, the second stage localization of FPL is carried out. Each distributed node implements SL based on the SRP method. By searching for the sound field energy value of the coordinates to be searched within a certain range and summing the energy value obtained by each node and finding the coordinate points corresponding to the maximum energy and the, which is the final position of the target sound source. That is the green, uh, the orange point. And the, the first and the second pores of the FPL are independent in the face of low noise, low reverberation environments. The practical application scenarios that require the fast response to the target sound source, they can perform only the first stage of the FPL for localization. When faced with the environment with more noise and reverberation, they can perform the both the first and the second stage of the FPL to obtain more precise localization results. In order to further improve the real-time performance of the, of the SSL system, we design the hardware accelerator, FRL for the FPL method. Because FPL is a two-stage algorithm and the two stages are independent of each other, we first designed the accelerator architecture based on the TDOA and the SRP as shown in the figure. As can be seen in the figure, the operation of some models are the same between the two architectures, such as sampling data from the microphone storing data in a simple buffer and the, the FFT operations. And the data of some model can be reused, such as the fault models. So we optimize these two architectures, and the optimized architecture is shown in the figure. We specifically make the following optimization. First, we share the same buffer and the windowing and the FFT operations, as shown in one and two. The effect of this operation is that the overhead of hardware resource can be significantly reduced. Second, we multiplex the fast model, the fast model. As shown in three, the fast operations of the TDOA and the SRP based are the same. The only difference is the number of channels. As shown in the figure, when the TDOA based fast operations are performed, some fast channels are disabled because they are not needed, and the input of the the disabled fat channels is zero to avoid any negative impact on the subsequent calculation result of the TDOA. When perform the SRP-based fat operations, all fat channels are, are active and receive data normally. 
And because the FPL method can choose different localization strategies to adapt to different sun source environments, so the hardware accelerator can also be configured for switching the localization strategies. In the hardware architectures, we introduce a model signal to configure the localization strategy of the accelerator, as shown in the figure. The model signal is a single bit signal with a default value of zero. When the model signal is zero, it means to perform the first stage of FPL, that is SSL based on the TDOA. When the first stage of the localization is completed, the value of the model signal can be updated by the up player software. When the model signal is one, it indicates that the second stage of the FPL method is performed. And the effect of this optimization is shown in the table. It can be seen that resource overhead after optimization is much lower than that before. Then we evaluate the proposed FPR method and FIR accelerator in terms of localization, precision, and speed. We first compare the FPR method with the TDOA method in localization precision. The related experimental results are shown in the figures. They print the localization performance of the TDOA and the FPR method under different numbers of dis distributed nodes. The first, second, and the third rows are based on two, three, and four nodes respectively. The green lines represent the X and the Y coordinates of the actual sound source, and the red and blue lines represent the X and the Y coordinates of the estimated results. Uh, and the, this figure shows the localization precision comparison of the three methods under different distance arrows. The table represents the main distance arrow of the three methods. It can be seen from the figure and the table that the localization perform of the FPO and SRP are both outstanding, are both outstanding and much better than the TDOA. Then we compare the software execution time of the three methods and the results are shown in the table. Where single nodes represents the time consumed on a single node to calculate the localization result and the total represents the total time consumed in the system. It can be seen that the localization time of the FPR is greatly reduced compared to SRP. Then we evaluate the performance of the FRL accelerator compared to the software implementing FPR method. Our FRL, our FRL accelerator can achieve 48.6 speed up compared with the other SSL hardware accelerators, the speed is increased by 20 to 838.2 times. Finally, I will talk about the conclusion. In our research, we propose the fast and persistent localization method to localize sound source fast and persistently, and to make the, and to make the SSL system have higher real-time performance, we design the FPL-based FRL accelerator the FIR accelerator can be configured into either the fast or persistent model to adapt to various environments. Our FIR accelerator can achieve many second levels of localization. That's all for my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Okay, okay, thanks Xiaofeng for the presentation. So uh, to, uh, whether the audience has some, some questions, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. So, is there any questions from the audience? Okay, uh, if there are no questions, maybe we can move the, to our last talk. And uh, uh, Sam, are you here? Oh, great, great, Sam. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, 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 we can hear you. So maybe you can, you can start uh, to share your screen and uh, do the preparation. And uh, let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, Sam received uh, the master's degree in computer science from the University of Ver 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 Verona in, uh, in Italy in 2019, uh, where he is currently a PhD, PhD student. So he, he has a PhD, a PhD and a master in the same university. His main research interests are related to embedded security with emphasis on edge cloud software ver verification. He is a member of the IEEE. So Sam, I, I, I will pass uh, uh, the thing to you. Maybe you can just start your Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Samuele Germignani from the University of Verona in Italy. 
and today I will be presenting our work titled Harm, a hint-based assertion minor. In this work, we present a novel methodology and corresponding tool to automatically generate assertions. So without any further ado, let's jump into it. The first thing I would like to discuss is what is an assertion minor? Well, it's a program capable of generating temporal assertions. Assertions are properties that must hold during the execution of the design. How does it do that? By analyzing the execution traces of the design, which are basically time series reporting the values of the variables over time. Execution traces are usually uh, uh, generated for simulation. So why would we want to use an assertion minor? Uh, because writing assertions is difficult. It requires domain-specific knowledge, uh, plenty of experience, and furthermore, it might take a very long time. So it doesn't come as a surprise if in the last few decades, many approaches have been developed to generate assertions automatically. Although these approaches are effective at generating properties, uh, they present several limitations. All approaches employing static analysis techniques require the source code of the design, making them suitable in, unsuitable in all verification flows in which the design is not available. Existing tools uh, work on a narrow predefined set of templates. Some tools don't allow the use of non-Boolean types uh, when generating assertions. Other tools allow the use of non-Boolean types, but they don't consider temporal behaviors. And finally, no tools allow the definition of the context in which the mine, mining should be performed, making them useful only on a small subset of applications. So uh, to overcome these limitations, uh, we developed a new methodology and corresponding tool presenting the following main characteristics. Uh, it implements a very fast mining engine with respect to the state of the art. It is agnostic with respect to the source code of the design, and it is highly configurable for all applications of uh, practical utility. Then it allows the generation of uh, the use of a wide range of LTL templates where the base template is always antecedent implies consequent, and both the antecedent and the consequent can be customized using all LTL temporal operators. Finally, uh, the user can define the mining context, greatly reducing the search space of the algorithm and improving the overall quality of the generated assertions. So how does our miner work? It works by taking as input a set of traces and user insights, and it returns as output a set of LTL assertions. Although the concept of trace and assertion is well known, we still have to define what we mean for user hints. So let's spend a few words on this. User hints are organized into contexts where each context contains a set of templates, propositions, and metrics. Templates define the temporal layer of the assertion. They can contain a special type of constructs called placeholders, which are basically holes that the, the algorithm we have to fill. After that, we have propositions which define the Boolean layer of the assertion. They can be constructed using Boolean, relational, arithmetic, and bitwise operators. Propositions are used by the miner to fill the placeholders in the templates. Finally, we have metrics, uh, which are used to rank the mine assertions. Metrics are numeric expressions involving one of more features of an assertion. Uh, an example of an assertion feature might be the support uh, which is the number of times in which the antecedent implies the consequent uh, on the input trace. So now that we have formalized uh, the inputs and outputs of this tool, let's take a look at our methodology, which is composed of three main steps 
instantiation of placeholders, social mining, and qualification. In the first step of the methodology, the algorithm combines propositions with, the, with templates. Uh, in particular, each uh, placeholder starting with a capital P is substituted with a proposition in the set P to generate a potentially instantiated template called PIT. Uh, the goal of the algorithm is to generate a reduced set of PITs uh, by analyzing the structure of the template in order to detect uh, redundancy and ignore them. In the second step of the methodology, uh, the miner does the actual mining. So starting from a set of pits, there are two scenarios. Uh, in the first scenario, uh, the pit is already fully instantiated as there are no more placeholders to be filled. Uh, so the pit is used directly to generate a new assertion by evaluating the pit on the trace. Uh, so if the antecedent implies the consequent for each instant of time, then a new assertion is found. In the second scenario, the pit still contains placeholders. In this example, the pit contains a special type of placeholder called decision tree operator, which demands the use of a decision tree algorithm to mine assertions. Uh, our decision tree algorithm employs an entropy-based heuristic uh, where each decision uh, aims at maximizing uh, the information gain. Uh, furthermore, each decision adds a new proposition to the uh, decision tree operator. And each time a combination of decisions generates a potentially instantiated template that holds on the input trace, then a new assertion is found. So for example, here the decision tree operator was substituted with this expression to generate a new assertion. In the last step of the methodology, uh, metrics are used to rank the assertions. Uh, the idea is that we want to allow the simultaneous employment of multiple metrics in a single ranking procedure. We implement that by giving more importance to assertion presenting a higher score in all metrics while penalizing assertion scoring well only on a subset or in none of the given metrics. Uh, we had to achieve that, we make use of this ranking uh, formula, which uses this calibrate function, which is a modified version of Richard's curve spanning from zero to one. As a last note, uh, uh, all metrics are normalized to improve readability. In this last slide, I will show you some of the results reported in the paper, where we compare HAM with two other well-known mining tools called Goldmine and ATEAM. The purpose of this first set of experiments is to measure the effectiveness of these tools at identifying faults injected into the design. Uh, so, the experiments were carried out as follows. First, uh, a fault was injected into the design. Then the design was re-simulated to generate a faulty trace. And finally, the mined assertions were re-evaluated on the faulty trace. If during this process an assertion fails, then the assertion covers the fault. We repeated this procedure for all uh, for five very log RTL designs and for hundreds of faults. In the third column of this table, uh, we report the full coverage uh, of all tools and, and for all designs. And it is easy to see how HAM uh, does better than the other tools in almost all instances. Uh, in the next column, we report the average number of faults covered by each uh, assertion. And with regard to this measure, HAM performs slightly better than the other two tools, suggesting a higher quality of the mine assertions. Finally, in the last column, we report the time to mine. And again, HAM uh, completely outperforms the other two tools. Uh, 
So in this uh, presentation, I introduced HAM, a hint-based assertion miner. HAM is an open source tool uh, freely available on GitHub, so feel free to check it out. And now, uh, if you have any questions, I look forward to answering to them. Okay, same, same, same for the for the presentation. So uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions uh, before the end of this session. Okay. So, uh, so for our audience, if you have any questions, maybe you can just uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions. And, or you, if you want, you can also type your question in the chat box. Chat box, and we can uh, we can. I, I think the. Sam can address these questions. Yes, for sure. Um, okay, so do we have the first question from the audience? If no, how about the second question? Okay, so if we do not have a, a, any further questions, maybe Sam, thanks for the presentation. And I think that, that will you. be the, the, the end of this session. Uh, thanks all for the attending. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Hello, hello. Hello. Yeah, oh, that's great. Um, my audio is working. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we are about like four minutes away of our session. And I, I saw that uh, our, our speakers are already in the, in the room. Uh, my name is Sean Chen. Um, I'm assistant professor in the George Mason University uh, in, in DC. <laughs> so uh, I'm morning, <laughs> I'm in the morning. Um, thank you so much for joining the session. Um, my research background is, is almost AI computing, mobile uh, devices, um, there's some fair learning. So hopefully I, I can have some particular um, interesting in some speakers words. That's very awesome. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think everybody's computer is already tested. Um, and um, because we have already using the session for um, also we went session several minutes ago. So I think all the sharings are okay. So basically, um, just, I think you have an idea, right? I will just briefly introduce everyone and uh, holding with some questions with our um, presentation. However, please be care careful about your uh, time lasting, try to um, control the um, timing in the frame. If you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, um, let's start our session. So um, hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for participating in our session three, uh, machine learning in the age of IoT. Our first paper is pervasive FL, pervasive federal learning for heterogeneous IoT systems. The speaker is Jun Xia. Uh, Jun Xia received the, P, uh, the, uh, the bench degree from the Department of Computer Science and Technology, uh, Hainan University in 2016 and a master's degree from the Department of Computer Science and Technology, Jiangnan University, China in, 19, uh, in 2019. He's currently working toward a PhD degree uh, with the Software Engineering Institute East China Normal University in Shanghai. So his research interests are in the areas of AIoT applications, trustworthy computing, and heterogeneous computing. So um, Junxia, you can start when you are ready. Yeah. Can you see my screen? It's streaming. Yeah, okay. this works very well. Okay, thanks for introduction. Hello everyone, my, my name is Jin Xia from East China Normal University. Today I would like to give a presentation on FL Pursive Federated Learning for Heterogeneous IoT System. 
And this talk consists of four parts. Firstly, I will introduce the motivation of our work and corresponding background. Then I will introduce our post-FL framework in detail. Finally, I will give the experimental results and the conclusion. Due to the merit of central model chaining on decentralized device data without compromising user privacy, federated learning allows knowledge sharing among devices and is becoming an emerging collaborative AI paradigm in IoT design. Note that the upload operation of classic federated learning assumes that the local device models have the same architecture as the global model on the cloud aggregate. However, this assumption is too ideal for modern IoT system, which typically compromise a variety of devices equipped with heterogeneous deep neural network models. The violation of this assumption strongly hinders the deployment of federated learning on IoT systems. Therefore, how to break through the barrier of model heterogeneity and enable effective knowledge sharing among devices is becoming a major bottleneck in the design of federated learning framework for IoT systems. To enable secure federated learning for IoT devices equipped with heterogeneous deep neural network models, we propose a novel lightweight cloud-based federated learning framework named FACFL, which enables the chaining of heterogeneous devices without posing any assumption. We introduce the concept of modulate that acts as an ominous portal for federated learning based on deep mutual learning. Our approach allows the mutual learning between modulates and local models on devices. Then we will introduce our FL framework as illustrated in this figure. The FL framework consists of two parts. The first part is the cloud server that mainly focuses on the aggregation of modulates. The second part is the heterogeneous HLT devices that concentrate on the chaining of local models. And the modulates based on their locally collected samples, its workflow involves six steps as follows. The first step is ensemble. At the beginning of local chaining, each selected device makes inferences from its local data based on the ensemble model, whose predictions are the average of predictions made by the pair of these corresponding modulate and local model. The second step is entropy-based decision gating. To judge the quality of knowledge that can be shared between modulates and local models, we propose the entropy-based decision gating method, which compares the entropy of predictions between modulates and ensemble models. The third step is the ADG-based deep mutual learning. Unlike traditional deep mutual learning in FL, it is unwise to conduct mutual learning equally between modulates and local models based on locally captured data. This is because in ID scenarios, the knowledge structure of modulates is quite different from the ones of local models. To address this issue, our approach uses the ensemble model together with our proposed entropy decision gating method to enable knowledge filtering which can ensure the quality of the learned knowledge by modulates from local models. Based on the entropy de definition, Poise FL compares the entropy of predictions for both modulates and ensemble models. The first step is gradient upload. At the end of local chaining, an IoT device will upload its modulate gradients to the cloud server, which are stored in the gradient buffer as shown in the figure. The such collected gradients will then be averaged to derive an aggregated modulate. The fifth step is called aggregation. The modulate gradients of all the select devices are received. This step will average such gradients and use this information to form a new modulate. The sixth step is modulate synchronization. The aggregated modulate on the cloud server will be dispatched to all the selected ALT devices for the next epoch chaining. To evaluate the effectiveness of our approach, we implemented our process AFL using PyTorch. All the experiments were conducted on a Ubuntu workstation and 10 JSON narrow boards. Note that the 10 boards were used to emu emulate partitional involved devices with heterogeneous models, while the other remaining devices only for the scalability analysis were simulated on the workstation. The JSON nano boards connect to the cloud server using a Wi-Fi environment. To comprehensively justify the possibility of our approach, we consider two kinds of data sets, three image data sets and one text data set. 
In each experiment, we use a lightweight model to act as the modulator for Poisson FL. We assumed that there are three types of models involved in one IoT system, and that is small, middle, and large, which are of different sizes. We conducted experiments on four well-known datasets. Due to the time constraints, we only present the experimental results on the image dataset. As the post-FL the post-FL indicates our post-FL approach, whose inference results come from the ensemble of both modulate and local models. The post-FL modulate denotes the case where the inference results come from the modulates of post-FL, while the post-FL local specifies the inference results come from the local models of post-FL. For example, from CIFAR 10 9 ID figure, we can observe that the post-FL modulate achieves the best inference in performance in the non-ID scenario, while it outperforms IL local more than 31% improvement. As more and more heterogeneous devices are integrated into complex IoT systems, the scalability plays an important role in the deployment of policy affair. This figure compares the inference accuracy of IoT systems with different scales in both ID and non-ID scenarios. From this figure, we can find that when more devices are involved in police FL, the overall inference accuracy will increase in both ID and non-ID scenario. As shown in the image net 10, the accuracy is increased by 3.17%. To evaluate the computation overhead of components introduced by police FL, we conducted various experiments to investigate their impacts on the overall training time. From this figure, we can find that one policy FL round needs slightly more training time than one fat average round that, however, it uh, needs short overall training time to achieve the same accuracy. Since policy FL shares knowledge among devices using small scale modulates, the computation overhead of policy FL is much smaller than traditional FL approaches. As an example for MJ10, the size of modulate gradients is 8.71 M, which needs 1.65 seconds on average for one round of communication. However, the gradient size of the large model is 162 M, which requires 13.96 seconds. In con conclusion, in this paper, we present a novel framework named Policy FL that enables effective and scalable federated learning on various heterogeneous devices with different kinds of models. By installing a lightweight deep neural network models uh, on each device, Policy FL allows mutual selective learning between the modulate and the local models on each device by using deep neural learning and our proposed entropy decision gating method. Meanwhile, since all the modulate in Policy FL are of the same structure, they can be used to conduct a federated learning style knowledge sharing among devices. In this way, Policy FL enables Policy federated learning on a large set of heterogeneous IoT devices with different types of local models. Comprehensive experiments on well-known datasets demonstrate the effectiveness of Policy FL from the perspectiveness of inference, performance, and scalability. That's all. Thanks for your listening. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah, during the question session, you can keep the screen sharing in case um, people have any questions regarding your slides or figures. Oh, oh, oh okay, okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, coincidentally, I also have some backgrounds in uh, heterogeneous field learning. So um, <clears throat> I have a small question, maybe I'm too dumb to understand. So when you're talking about the module list, is this a subnet or more like a mix expert? Um, is like every module like is a ResNet and or mo mo uh, mobile net? Uh, okay. Mm, uh, as, as, as you can see, my pop uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, Mac computer. It's fine. It's fine. I think it's on page four or five something. Yeah. Okay. As you can see, the, uh, as you can see, our experimental experimental settings. You can see the modulator. You can also add the sub 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 subnet subnet model, or you can uh, you can choose the rest net um, smaller rest net or smaller models. Oh, I got but, it. But yeah. uh, but but uh, but in your experimental ob observation, if the size is too small, um, the the knowledge sharing may be. Uh, not very real. So yeah. we so, we only so you're using we a only whole model choose, as a, a modulus, right? Yeah, we only okay. choose the more most small model, uh, such as a mm, ten ten percent small size. We can see this. You can see this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, basically, I, I remember you you team your team has another paper called that entropy. So that's some a paper you can uh, exchange entropies through different scales of similar models. Um, yeah. My, yeah. My another question is when you have this uh, more like um, multimodality models, right? So does this model, uh, they, they don't, do they have some feature engineering interactions or they just stand alone and work on their own threads? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Anto. Uh, yeah, sorry. That, does this model that has some uh, interactions or they just work on their own? Mm. They, yeah. they can learn from they can learn from each other, but uh, not uh, uh, directly learn from each each other. Uh, we use the ensemble model. Yeah. We use an ensemble model to to sh to share the knowledge more 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 frequently. But we, I think mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Uh, you can see this figure. Mm -hmm. The mo so this is the model. This is the local model, and the predictions we we will also calculate the entropy. After after calculated mm. after this, we can see if we will use the entropy decision gating to filter some uh, filter some bad knowledges and uh, give the modulate give the modulate more benign knowledge. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah so this, so this, this this collaboratively learning modulates are like the same track modulates from different devices, right? What I mean is modulates on the same device. Um, are you planning to do some maybe feature, feature engineering or some multimodality learning between them? I mean, on a single device. It sounds like you're not working on that, right? But maybe that's uh, maybe a try in the future. <laughs> the, I'm not sure it's already there. The the modulates on the same device. Uh, um, the modulator we we can um we can see the modulator. I think uh, we will use the JSON Nano to emu emulate the experimental ex mm -hmm. experimental experiments. Um, however, if the device can get the modulate, you can uh, it can join the policy FL. I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, after after all this, after federated learning begins, the device need to upload the model size, or that uh, it can carry out the maximum, such as uh, the model. If the JSON Nano can get the model, it we will let it join our policy FL. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my next, uh, our next speaker is uh, Yue Tang. So maybe you can share your screen. Oh, sorry, 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 oh, sorry. My, my, my thought. My next. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. It's it's not not your time. Um, uh, the next speaker. Um, oh, let me double check. Sorry, let me double check. I think the next speaker is Enrico, which yeah, will Enrico. play the yeah. recorded video okay. that he has presented. Could you replay? Sure, I will uh, share the recorded video yeah, for the well, presentation.
Good morning. I am Enrico Tabanelli from the University of Bologna. Can you hear the sound and see the video? Yes, it's pretty good. You can just play it through. And I'm a third year PhD working in a research group of Professor Luca Benini. Today I will present my latest research on optimizing the inference of random forest based algorithms, RS5 MCUs. Random forests are widely adopted among a broad range of ML applications. They aggregate many weak decision trees, building a stronger learner. They present higher explainability and interpretability than black gloves ML and achieve good results with small datasets and high dimensional feature spaces. In this context, random forests have already reached high accuracy in IoT applications. Some examples are health monitoring and wearable devices and unintrusive mo load monitoring. Pushing the ref inference toward the TinyML paradigm can bring several benefits. By the way, TinyML platforms are highly resource constrained, making ML applications design challenging. For example, monitoring systems extract biosignals with sampling frequencies up to 10 kHz, thus requiring about 100 microseconds per inference. Instead, NILM demands one microseconds per inference since it leverages high frequency features up to 1 MHz. At the same time, state-of-the-art work on uh, random forest at the edge do not cope with such latency requirements. They achieve, for example, 50 milliseconds per inference on the Raspberry Pi 3B and 120 microseconds per inference on the ARM Cortex M4 architecture. Thus, there is a need to optimize RF-based algorithms to unleash their potential at the edge and leverage tiny ML benefits. Optimizing random forests for fast inference without accuracy loss is a challenging task for traditional MCUs. In particular, making a prediction demands non-uniform memory access. Computations are disclosed only at runtime, and the algorithm is memory bounded. Considering that the majority voting resources are negligible compared to decision trees requirements, we introduce a collection of optimized DT kernels designed to reduce the computational and memory costs required to re-execute a RAP models on MCUs. Thus, we perform an experimental assessment of our proposed kernels on Paltissimo, a RIS-5 MCU supporting a wide set of ML and DSP-centric instructions. So, the main contribution of this paper are this is the design of three alternative DT kernels optimized to execute on resource-constrained MCUs. We optimize the kernels on Paltissimo using the baseline rv 32 imfc isa and then leverage the XPAL v2 extension to improve the CPI. We present a per kernel fine grained analysis pinpointing a hardware agnostic and platform dependent optimizations. We compared alternative kernels proposed against the largely adopted naive DT design. We also illustrate the computations and storage costs demanded by the alternative designs with kernel dependent and platform specific metrics. Several strategies, strategies have been investigated to accelerate tree based algorithms inference. Hard coding DT structuring to the C program leads to inefficient executions on MCU. Instead, the trading between efficiency and precision compromises inference accuracy. On the FPGA side, encoding details into instructions deploys IRF uh, representation not supported by MML frameworks. At the same time, comparator centric accelerators. Hard code RF structure into hardware but requires large resources. In memory computing, accelerators require an optimal voltage tuning to avoid accuracy drops, and the conductor noise can easily lead to the computation to computational accuracy. We selected the naive kernel as comparison baseline since it corresponds to a widely adopted solution in literature for embedded application. Such an approach simply consists of fully unfolding the DT structure into a sequence of nested if then else statements until reaching the leaf nodes. The first alternative kernel is the DT loop, which represents the tree node as a recursive data structure and closes the mandatory node attributes. The children properties present two variables sharing the same space address, representing the pointer to the child node and the leaf class. This algorithmic variant allows traversing trees through a while loop statement. Lastly, to discriminate leaf on decision nodes, we tag leaf node thresholds with a dedicated out of range value. The DT rack uh, embeds 
leave nodes into parent decision nodes, thus allowing roughly a 25% space decrease, but demanding to extend the node data structure by two additional fields. The kernel routine consists of a recursive function calling itself whenever accessing new decision nodes. Lastly, the DT array kernel, adopt an array-based tree representation consisting of storing nodes in two tree arrays. This representation avoids memory alignment, enabling a fine-grained tuning at the byte level to save memory. Furthermore, the kernel deploys the threshold to distinguish leaf from decision nodes in the while loop conditions. The experiments have been conducted on Palpissimo, an SOC integrating a 32-bit RISC 5 based processor with a FPU. The RISC core features a four-stage in order single issue pipeline featuring the extended RV32 IMFC XPALP2 ISA. Algorithms are implemented in a high-level machine independency language and compiled using the open source PALP GCC toolchain supporting the ISA. Lastly, we have targeted uh, two standard datasets representing general IoT application and deployed the CQTLR ML framework for training. We also set the RF model to be populated by 16 decision trees. Now we'll present the results achieved starting from the per kernel fine grained analysis. The naive DT kernel execu execution is largely bounded by structure miss. The massive code size accounts for about 80% of the memory footprint leading to a high pressure on today's structure cache and the degradation of the CPI. Moving to the struct-based DT loop kernel, decreases the computing time and delivers a 1.3 CPI. Since GCC toolchain aligns unpacked structured members, we evaluate an optimized kernel that avoids memory alignment. Such an approach leads to an overall 14% storage reduction. By the way, the memory alignment involves performing additional misaligned loads resulting in a slowdown. Moving to the unpacked struct-based DT rec kernel reduces memory and inference time. A higher control hazard and load stall contribute to a suboptimal CPI. To further reduce the memory footprint with supported packed struct version, due to the lacking of memory alignment, the core performs extra misaligned loads to access structure fields, including a 14% slowdown Lastly, the baseline array-based design reaches an optimal memory reduction and near-optimal CPI. In the shiftless version, we pre-compute offline offset addresses, diminishing the computing time, but at the expense of a 16% memory increment. Instead, the stall-free version decreases stalls by reading both child nodes with a single memory access. The optimization allows reaching our near rear load stalls leading to a 16% speed up featured by a near idle CPI. Comparing the kernels, the naive method uh, represents the most resource demanding design, while the newly introduced kernels move to less demanding constraints. Pareto optimal solutions allow reaching speed ups ranging from 4 to 4.8x and up to 45% memory footprint reduction. Our optimized kernels reach 4.5 microseconds latency and to, uh, 220 kilo inferences per second throughput, while reducing the energy usage down to 15.6 picojoule. In the table, we report the computer memory costs. The naive kernel features the most expensive picojoule per decision. Instead, optimized kernels reach about 0 0.15 picojoule per decision. Furthermore, DT to loop and the TR design reduces the node memory to 16 bytes per node and beyond. To conclude, the paper introduced the design of decision tree kernels to optimize the random forest inference on MCUs. We evaluated the performance on a RISC 5 platform. By adopting runtime optimization, we also improved the resources requirements. We propose an overall decision tree kernel comparison. And lastly, we summarize time and memory costs. That's all. Thank you a lot for the attention. If you would like, you can visit the code of the paper at the link. Okay. Um, I think we can catch up the schedule faster. So shall we directly move to the next paper?
Yes. Okay. So yeah, sorry. Uh, so this time, uh, Tang Yue, could you just share a screen? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, so let me give you an introduction first. Uh, sure. Yeah, nice to see the cathedral learning again. I graduated from it. Yeah. So Yue uh, Tang is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh in, in ECE department. She is advised by Jing Tong, uh, Jing Tong Hu. She received her uh, bachelor and master degree from the School of Automation Science and Electrical Engineering at uh, Beihang University, China. Her current research interests include FPGA-based CNN training and on-device artificial intelligence. So, yeah, please go ahead for your talk. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, I'm Yue from the University of Pittsburgh. Today, I will introduce my research on enabling weekly supervised temporal action localization from on-device learning of the video stream. I have the following parts to talk about. The introduction, the framework of the whole learning process, with this framework, we propose two, these two approaches. Finally, I will display the experimental results and provide our conclusion. Uh, so begin with the introduction. Nowadays, detecting actions in videos has been widely applied in lots of on-device applications. For example, in healthcare, the devices can recognize an elderly person falling down or not. Currently, Practical on-device video is always captured as a continuous stream. The video is untrimmed, which means it contains both multiple actions and backgrounds. It is desirable for a model to recognize both the class of action and localize the temporal position where the action happens. Such a task is called temporal action localization. Currently, this task is always trained on the centralized cloud where multiple untrimmed videos are collected and labeled. However, such a process cannot adapt to a new environment. Therefore, it is desirable for a model to continuously and directly learn from local data on the device. However, it is challenging to directly train such a uh, temporal action localization model on the device. To precisely train such a model, tremendous data are required with temporal annotations. Generating such annotations is expensive and prone to cause errors. Therefore, a weekly supervised temporal action localization has been proposed, which can learn with only video level labels. However, such weekly supervised TIL cannot directly be applied to on-device learning scenarios because of the following issues. Firstly, current models are learned from well-divided videos. Each video is considered as a training sample and contains only one or limited classes of actions. However, in practical on-device applications, the camera keeps collecting video frames in hours or days, and the the actions of nearly all classes are included in a single long video. Separating the video into individual uh, videos requires lots of human labeling costs. Besides, to provide video level labels for different video segments, the whole video needs to be uploaded to the Cloud Oracle, which is also inefficient. And up to now, we are the first attempt to directly learn from the on-device non-video stream that aims to solve these problems. Now I will introduce the on-device video learning framework. Uh, before introduce the framework, uh, I need to revisit the video learning approaches. In this paper, we use this weekly supervised uh, TLO back, back uh, baseline cola as our backbone. And uh, this work uses contrastive learning to distinguish between action and the background clips during the training process with video level labels. Um, it uses a frozen pre-trained 3D scene encoder to extract uh, 
this features I from RGB frames and optical flows of each video. And this embedded features E I extracted from this I. And it uses a mining strategy to select embedded features of easy action, easy background, hard action, and hard background. The easy action means it has the top K highest action attention values. So it is more likely to be an action. Hard action and hard background are located between easy action and easy background. But the boundary is hard to distinguish. But the hard action is supposed to be closer to be easy action. Therefore, they use a contrastive score to make the features of easy action and the hard action, uh, easy action and hard action similar. So the boundary between action and background will be more explicit. Unlike Cola, which is learned from a set of manually separated video files, we explore learning from a long and raw video stream directly captured by on-device cameras without laborious manual splitting. So here is our workflow, which has three steps. In the first step, the camera keeps collecting streaming data. The single stream is divided into non-overlapping segments uniformly with TO clips per segment. We call them original segments. Same with previous weekly supervised works. We use a frozen encoder to extract the features and only fine tune the networks after the encoder. In the second step, we select the most representative clip, TMOST, for each segment and only send TMOST to the Oracle. In the third step, we use the weekly labeled segments to update the model. There are two challenges to consider. The first is in step three, how to pre-process the labeled segments and split them as effective training samples. We propose a self-adaptive dividing approach. It will be introduced in the next part. The second, the second challenge is that if we cannot get segment level labels of all the original segments from the Oracle, we need to find the approach to select the most representative video segments for labeling in step two. To solve this challenge, we propose an interest-based sampling strategy that selects the segments that contain more interesting areas. It will be introduced in the fourth part. Now I will introduce the self-adaptive video dividing approach to address the first challenge. So in the workflow, the stream is divided into these original segments with a predefined lens TO. Assume the Cloud Oracle can provide segment level labels for all the original segments. In each training epoch, we can merge adjacent segments in a self-adaptive manner. We propose a contrast score-based merging approach, which is shown in this figure. So starting from the first segment, if two adjacent segments share the same segment level label, we'll select the clips that are predicted as easy actions and the easy background. We decide whether to merge the previous segment and the current segment together by comparing the mean of this contrast score of the two segments before merging and the score of the segment after merging. If the mean of the scores uh, before merging is higher than that of the merged segment, we merge the two segments. Otherwise, it means the segments before merging already include explicit easy action and easy background. Thus, they have complete action and the background information and do not need to be merged. In previous part, we assume the Cloud Oracle can provide labels for all segments. It is also necessary to sample the most important segments based on the labeling budget of the Oracle. In this part, we propose an interest-based sampling strategy that selects segments that have more interesting areas. So in this figure, we use the pre-trained model to find a non-overlapping action proposals area one for each segment I. And then we merge three segments together and predict non-overlapping action proposals that are located in segment I, which is area two. The intersect proposals of area one and two are represented as the interest. And we use the following equation to judge the score and select the segments with highest scores based on the labeling budget. Now I will introduce the experimental results. So here is the experimental setup. We use the same SOMOS 14 dataset with our Cola baseline 
I like, unlike the baseline, which turns the model from separate untrimmed videos, we combine the videos together with different orders to form a single long video stream. And we consider the following situations. First, the videos are randomly combined. And the second, they are randomly combined, but at least two consecutive videos in the input stream are from the same class. And third, all the videos from the same class are consecutive in the input stream. These three different situations represent different temporal correlations of the input stream. So first, I will show the experimental result of the merging approach. We compare the proposed contrast score-based merging with result merging, random merging, and the merging of strategies. And it can be shown that the contrast score-based merging with one iteration per epoch performs better in general. We also analyze the performance in each situation in detail in our paper. And now let's see the performance of different merging and sampling strategies. We compare the proposed interest-based sampling strategy with random sampling and uncertain sampling. We also compare different situations under the aforementioned uh, three situations. So it can be seen that the proposed interest-based approach, the IS, outperforms other strategies uh even use different uh, even under different merging strategies and uh, here is the conclusion uh that's all thank you okay any questions Uh, I have a small question. Uh, sure. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I just uh, curious. I have never done video planning before, just curious. Um, uh, I know that um, in lots of um, video encoding, like H.264, uh, those video encoding techniques, um, they have um, lots of like pre-analysis of the video contents. Also, I also know that some people, especially for the wireless encoding people, they leverage lots of like reserved uh, coding space, uh, which is reserved empty coding space to incorporate lots of like video interpretation or um, uh, into the encoding to facilitate like uh, video compression, those kind of things, uh, which also gave, you know, decoder some idea about the background program, lots of, you know, uh, similar uh, um, considerations as you have. So yeah, this is just curious. So uh, is there any work just combining the, with the learning uh, with the video encoding or are you guys planning uh, some similar stuff? Is this a valid question? Uh, my work just used the uh, frozen the encoder. So, mm -hmm. so we have not uh, do much about the uh, encoder part because so in, in this, in this uh, temporal action localization task, uh, those uh, so if if we need to uh, if we need to fine tune the encoder, it will have lots of uh, have lots of uh, co uh, computation uh, overhead, and uh, so most uh, most weekly supervised uh, temporal action localization just uh, use a frozen encoder. And uh, fine tune the uh, fine tune the models after uh, after that, so they have already extracted the feature in here. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it can also uh, be a good uh, be a good future work to to do the encoder because in in this in this in this task the the length of the of each video or the length of the video stream is. Uh, um is uh it uh is unknown so, um, mm -hmm. there are some uh work there are some work based on the encoder that deal with the trimmed videos which means these videos only have the actions but in such task it has both the trim video and the maybe very long useless background so it makes it hard to uh fine tune the whole encoder but it's it can be a 
uh, those just because it is challenging, so it can be a very, uh, very promising future work. I think. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, we can move to the next paper. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker. I think our next speaker is Negi. Negi, sorry. Um, hi. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, Did you? So can I you share know? the screen? Do I have the access? I think so. Do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're in a, a working progress session. So the first uh, work is. What to expect of early training statistics investigation on hardware aware neural architecture search is a mass paper. So the speaker is nagging his PhD students in the department of uh, ECE at McGraw University from Canada. Their research interests include machine learning and intelligence and the multi object optimization. They are currently working on the modeling and optimization of the transformer based neural language processing for resource constrained computer system at the edge. Yes, please proceed. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Negin, and I'm a PhD student at McGill University. Uh, today, I'm talking about our work in progress about utilizing latency and accuracy predictors for efficient hardware awareness. Um, during the recent years, uh, many of the state-of-the-art language models, such as transformers and BERT models, has become more and more complex to the point that deploying them on a resource-constrained uh, platform has become impractical because of their hardware limits. Uh, latency Ever Neural Architecture Search, or NAS, is an effective solution to find uh, the models that satisfy these constraints by adding uh, latency feedback in addition to accuracy feedback during the search loop. However, collecting these on-device latency and accuracy feedback would significantly slow down the NAS process. As a solution, uh, we proposed a framework that uh, predicts both accuracy and latency of our target models on our target devices by, and removes the uh, online hardware feedback from the search loops. Our methodology consists of four phases. At first, we define the design space of our target architecture, and then we profile the selected models on our target hardware. And after that, we train the predictors based on the measured data set. And finally, we integrate the predictors into the NAS framework and search for the best trade-offs between the latency and accuracy of the design space. In our experiments, we uh, selected Dynabert as our test case. Uh, Dynabert is a supernet with uh, adaptive uh, depths and uh, widths. Uh, this flexibility allows us to sample many design points from the uh, Dynabert's architectures without the need to retrain the models from the scratch. And after that, we um, profiled our models on JSON TX2 GPU, which is an embedded GPU and resulted on 400 design points, uh, which you can see in this figure uh, with their measured latency and error values. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, experimented with uh, five different uh, predictors, um, including gradient boosting, random forest, K, uh, K nearest neighbor, neighborhoods, polynomial regression, and DNN, and um, measured the uh, performance with uh, multiple metrics. Um, since uh, our goal is to uh, find, uh, and after uh, using these predictors, we search for the front line of our design space in order to find the trade offs. And since our goal is to find the closest predicted front line to the true part or front line of our design space. Um, in our case, ADRS or average distance from the reference set is a better metric for us compared to root mean square error or error bands because we are searching for the um, accuracy of frontline predictions. 
Um, that's why uh, we uh, selected ADR uh, random forest with the best ADR result as our final predictor. And this predictor was able to uh, only uh, predict the front line and just miss two design points on the Pareto front line of the design space while achieving uh, up to 57 times the speed up uh, during the NAS process. Um, thank you so much for your attention and like, I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Yeah, sorry for my mistake. I, I, I mistaken your, um, um, paper title. Could you, if you paper title can by yourself, maybe to sure. a better introduction. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, the paper should be utilizing latency and accuracy predictors for NAS. Yeah, I just gave a, a skip paper. Okay, to catch up time, maybe we can move to the, uh, the last presentation. Um, sorry, uh, the, for the Rosen, uh, we have one uh, paper, the uh, uh, the first work in progress. I didn't see the speaker in the um, room. The the uh, what to expect of early training statistics. Are we skipping this paper, or we have our speaker here? Mm, so if we don't have the speaker for one session, we wait. We are not going to move to the second. Okay. Do okay. We... Maybe we just move to the bio. So, I'm. I'm... I'll well, have the recording for mm -hmm. uh, which speakers. I think we first move to uh, Yunji's, uh, Ching Ji's paper, and then we can check later. So Yunji Ching, are you ready? I can share the recording for Jiang Zhang Lu. Maybe we can put to the last. Okay. Let's let's yeah, need to speak up first. Uh Yunji, hello. Oh, it didn't work in dry round. Okay, so let's let's put videos. Yeah, I will uh, play the yeah, video. So we have two videos to play. One is what to expect. Another video is bio circle and then, yeah. So we're first going to uh, share the uh, presentation what to expect of early training statistic. And if you want to do some introduction, then I will play the video. Yeah, I think you can play the video. Yeah. Hello, this is Xiang Zhong, a PhD student from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Today, I will present our work in progress paper named What to Expect of Early Training Statistics and Investigation on Hardware Aware and New Architecture Search. In this slides, I introduce the proposed proxy named Trend Batchwise uh, Estimation, which is reliable and also computationally. Uh, efficient. Specifically, we tag the early training statistics as the input and the train MLP model to predict the accuracy of the given architecture. In this slide, we compare the correlation performance of TBE against another two relevant proxies, named TSE and BTE. As shown in this figure, we observe that under the same Training budgets, TB consistently achieves better correlation performance on NAS Bench 201. To make it more intuitive, we visualize the relationships between the test accuracy and the normalized architecture score using TBE, BTE, and TSE. As shown in this figure, we observe that under the same training budgets of two epochs, TPE consistently achieves better uh, performance, uh, which is more reliable. 
In these slides, we take a query based NAS method uh, like ANAS as the search engine and use TBE to quickly evaluate the performance of possible architecture candidates. As shown in this table, we observe that TBE is able to find the architecture with higher accuracy but lower latency than previous relevant methods. In this slide, we directly compare TBE with another two relevant proxies under the same training budgets of two epochs. As shown in this figure, we observe that under the same latency constraint, TBE consistently obtains the architecture with higher accuracy, which shows the effectiveness of TBE. That's all. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Rosen, maybe we move to the next. Mm, sure. Yeah, since we don't have the author here to answer this question. Oops. Happened. Yeah, the next question, the next um, paper is um, Yun Ji Qing's work, is also. Um, the, it's also a working progress is, uh, oh, sorry, glow circle and, and efficient software hardware co-design approach for neural network accelerators with block circulant matrix. Since uh, Inji's microphone has some problems, we could just play um, the video, but give a quick introduction. Um, Inji Qing received a bachelor degree in computer science and technology from University of Science and Techn Technology of China in 2022. Uh, yeah, just graduated. So he is currently working toward a master's degree in the computer system architecture with the School of Computer Science and Technology of University of Science and Technology of China. So his research interests include FPGA accelerators and embedded systems. Since uh, Yun Chi Ching is, is in the Zoom room, so maybe after the video playing, uh, if anyone is interested, can raise questions in the chat thread. Okay, let's play the video. Um, Roshi, could you share the video or I can do that? Sure. Um, I just have a small technical issue. I will. Okay, maybe share. I can do that too. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'll just go play. Yeah. The key idea of our work is to use block circuit wave matching to compress DNN networks and decide the constanting accelerator using a high level synthesis. This way, software designer can also easily and quickly finish the accelerator design. This is the main architecture of convolutional components. We mainly use Telsing and double buffer design. The architecture is simple but achieves efficient results. Oh, it's a very quick. So, so Regan, shall we uh, stop here or is a break? Any questions? Okay, so I think we're just uh, up to the time of 12 o'clock.
but in China it's already 12 o'clock. So maybe uh, we can stop our session here. And if you have any questions, you can um, reach the authors in the gather town. Oh, I saw uh, Zhao Xun is also here. So any, uh, he's our co-chair. So any questions? Yeah, thank you for your host, Xiang. Uh, okay. I don't have other questions. So I think, yeah, we can disassemble, <laughs> right? So stop here and uh, have a good day, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Xiang. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.